Welcome to the third season of Murder in 20 Podcast, where I, Bobby Stevens, am your host with a new episode every Wednesday. If you're a serious fan of true crime and love listening to podcasts, but don't want all that small talk, you've come to the right place. We get right to the facts. Murder in 20 episodes are concise and complete in 20 minutes. Less talk and more true crime. Be sure to like, share, and follow us to learn about upcoming episodes. During the holiday season, we're featuring a recap of Murder in 20's most intriguing episodes. Thanks for tuning in. Now let's get to this week's episode. Winter in Cedar Rapids in Iowa can sometimes be brutally cold with lots of snow. By December, the temperature in the small city can dip down to 33 degrees Fahrenheit. Michelle Martinko was born in 1961. Her mother had numerous miscarriages and Michelle was their miracle baby. Raised by her loving parents, Janet and Albert, Michelle grew up with her doting older sister, Janelle. Although 12 years apart, they were close and Michelle was a flower girl at her wedding. Michelle had lots of interests. She sang and acted in plays. She loved design and had plans to go to college and become an interior designer. The Cedar Rapids Gazette described how she decorated her bedroom with a geometric wallpaper in pink, red, and silver, futuristic lights, and a furry bedspread. Outside hung a sign declaring, Michelle's room. Although her mother didn't particularly care for how her room was decorated, she admired her creative spirit. When she was 12, Michelle was diagnosed with scoliosis, which is where the spine curves. She wore a brace from her neck to her hips. It was a difficult period for Michelle, but fortunately, after a couple of years, she no longer needed the brace. She felt free and spread her wings. Vera Fawcett was the pin-up poster girl in the mid-70s with her long blonde hair layered and feathered back. Michelle had long blonde hair and adopted the hairstyle. She had flourished into a beautiful young woman with flawless skin and glowing chubby cheeks. At 16, she was roller skating with her friend Gail when she met Andy Sedell a handsome young man who drove a sports car and looked older than his 18 years with a short dark hair and mustache. They dated for two years until Michelle decided she no longer wanted to be tied down to a serious relationship. Andy was upset. He wasn't ready to let go of Michelle. He constantly wanted to know where she was and talked to her friends to try and find out, and asking if she was dating anyone. And in fact, she was. She'd started dating Mike Wyrick. It was December 19, 1979, and the stores were busy with Christmas shoppers. Michelle attended an annual banquet at a hotel, She dressed up for the evening with a black dress with spaghetti straps. The bodice was tight-fitting with a skirt that flared out. She wrapped a matching black scarf around her neck, and even though it was winter, she wore pantyhose and open-toed, high-heeled shoes. She paired it with a brown leather purse and a brown and white fur jacket. The event ended at 7 p.m., and afterwards she had plans to visit the new Westdale Mall to pick up a coat her mother had put on layaway for her. She asked some friends if they'd like to go with her, but they weren't interested. Michelle drove the family's tan-colored four-door Buick to the mall. In the cold winter night, she parked by the J.C. Penney store. Working in retail, she was trained to leave the closed parking spots for the customers, and parked closer to the back, far from the overhead lights. She had $180 in cash in her purse to buy a coat, but changed her mind. 
CBC News reported that she did some shopping and went from store to store visiting friends and acquaintances, including Tracy Price, who spotted the cash and told Michelle to put it away and not let anyone see it. The stores were closing at 9 p.m., just as Michelle headed to her car. She had to get home and study for an exam. It was dark out as she walked across the parking lot. She opened the rear door and threw her shopping bags onto the back seat, then unlocked the driver's door and got behind the wheel. She put the key in the ignition. The engine fired up as the heater blew on to the windows. She waited for them to defrost. Then she reached for the gear shift on the steering column to slide it from park to drive. When all of a sudden, the door flew open. 25-year-old Jerry Burns was watching Michelle. He slipped on rubber gloves and reached for the door handle. He reached in and tried to grab Michelle. She immediately resisted. Jerry stabbed Michelle. She didn't back down and continued to fight him off with her hands. Jerry didn't stop until he stabbed her 29 times in the head and chest. Michelle died at 18. Her body lay on the front seat as Jerry disappeared into the shadows. He returned to his home, his wife, and children and pretended it never happened. When Michelle wasn't home by 10 p.m., her mother became worried and started calling her friends, while her father went out looking for her. After three agonizing hours, Albert called the police and reported their daughter missing. At 4 a.m., police discovered the car, drenched in blood, and Michelle on the front seat. One of the detectives working that night was Harvey Denlinger. In his career, he had never seen anyone so viciously stabbed. The police investigation determined that she had not been robbed, nor was she sexually assaulted. Her killer had left no evidence, no fingerprints, no hairs or fibers, no murder weapon, and no clues as to his identity. Through the media, police asked witnesses to come forward, anyone who might have seen Michelle in the parking lot. Michelle's family were devastated. Her father plunged into a black hole of anger as sadness engulfed her mother. At her funeral, her ex-boyfriend Andy bent over her casket and put his arms around Michelle. Janet and Albert buried their daughter at the Cedar Memorial Park Cemetery. Her gravestone lay flat against the earth, inscribed with the words, Beloved Daughter. A few witnesses came forward and recalled seeing Michelle at 9 p.m. as they were heading to the movie theater. Police felt that it was very likely that Michelle knew her killer. They interviewed her ex-boyfriend, Andy. He told them that he had run into Michelle at the mall that night, but that they were cordial, and he was home shortly after the mall closed. Although his mother corroborated his alibi, investigators were suspicious, and so were Michelle's family and many folks in Cedar Rapids. Police also investigated Michelle's recent ex-boyfriend, Mike. Although he was a hundred miles away attending college, they brought him in for questioning and pressed him hard. At one point, trying to get him to crack, they placed the crime scene photos in front of him, a vision he'll never forget. A $10,000 reward was offered but only generated two phone calls. 
They used hypnotism on witnesses to help their memories and brought in psychics. Four months after her murder, investigators still had no leads on her killer. Detectives had interviewed 166 witnesses and given polygraphs to three possible suspects. All three passed and were ruled out. Detectives devised a theory that Michelle's car may have been moved, that she may have been driven somewhere else, murdered, and brought back to the mall. In the summer of 1980, two witnesses came forward. Both women said they recalled a man in the parking lot that night. They went under hypnosis and a sketch was drawn of a man in his late teens or early 20s with brown eyes and curly brown hair. By the first anniversary, the Cedar Rapids police had made no arrests. More than 800 people had been interviewed. They vowed that her murder case would remain open until her killer was caught. Two years after they lost Michelle, her father had a stroke brought on by the stress of his daughter's brutal and sudden death. Her mother Janet wasn't coping well either. She didn't sleep much and often fantasized that it was all a bad dream and that Michelle would walk back through the door. She kept the house neat and tidy and sat by the window, waiting for that day. She could still hear her voice, then reality would come crashing back and she would visit Michelle's grave. Christmas every year was hard. For Michelle's parents, it opened the floodgates of hurt and pain. For the detectives who worked her case, it reminded them that it was still unsolved. No one ever forgot Michelle. In the summer of 1995, Michelle's father Albert passed away, and he too was buried at the Cedar Memorial Park Cemetery. Three years later, her mother Janet joined her daughter and husband. In 1999, a memorial ad in the local newspaper stated, 20 years ago today, someone took your life away. Never a December goes by without thoughts of you. With a prayer that your killer never rests. In 2004, Michelle's fur coat was sent to a lab for analysis with the hope that they would find evidence using new techniques Sadly, they did not. By 2005, Detective Doug Larison was in charge of her case. Years earlier, he had gone to school with Michelle, and he felt a responsibility to solve it. When he examined Michelle's case file, he discovered that another detective had sent a blood sample taken from the car's gear shift for testing and that when the report came back, it was put in the file. But no one ever looked at it. That is, until he pulled it out. It revealed that the blood sample contained male DNA. That prompted Doug to look into what other evidence was stored away. He found Michelle's dress and sent it for testing. The test came back and revealed that a spot of blood on her dress contained a full DNA profile and that the DNA matched the one found on the gear shift. Doug sent the DNA evidence to the CODIS database, hoping for a hit. But it turned out that Jerry Burns had never been arrested. Now, investigators had to find a needle in a huge haystack in Iowa. So Doug went back to the suspect list and tracked down Michelle's ex-boyfriend, Andy. For 27 years, the people of Cedar Rapids thought he was her killer. Now was his chance to prove them wrong. 
he agreed to submit his DNA. He was not a match. Neither were the other 99 people that detectives gathered DNA from, including her ex-boyfriend Mike. Ten years went by, and Doug was no closer to finding who the DNA belonged to, who killed Michelle. So in 2015, he asked his supervisors to bring in someone to help. That person was Detective Matt Denlinger. His father, Harvey, was one of the original detectives on the case 36 years earlier. Matt looked at the case with fresh eyes and wondered how they could use the DNA to get more information on the killer. He heard about Parabon Nanolabs in Virginia and their snapshot phenotyping technique. Using the suspect's DNA, they put a face to it. He was likely a white male with blonde hair and blue eyes. The Des Moines Register reported that the Cedar Rapids police chief believed that the new images would provide the information they needed to solve the case. But Matt discovered there were a lot of blonde, blue-eyed men in Cedar Rapids. Hundreds of tips poured in. It would take years to investigate them all. Then in the spring of 2018, fate stepped in. Joseph D'Angelo, the Golden State Killer, was arrested. His crimes of burglary, kidnapping, rape and murder spanned a dozen years. He was finally caught using genetic genealogy and a public database called GEDmatch, where people voluntarily provided their DNA to trace their ancestors. Investigators were able to track down his distant relatives, which eventually led them to Joseph. This gave Matt an idea. He contacted Parabon again and asked if they could do that with the DNA sample that he'd already given them. They ran the sample and within a few months got back to Matt with the results. Parabon had discovered a relative of Michelle's killer, Randy Jennings, in Vancouver, Washington. She was a second cousin once removed. Matt traced Brandy's family tree using birth and death records and even managed to convince some of her relatives to provide their DNA. Then he contacted Parabon again and asked for their help. They narrowed it down to three possibilities, three brothers living in Iowa, Donald, Kenneth, and Jerry Burns. Matt learned that they were all still alive. He and his team covertly got a DNA sample from each of them. From the two brothers, they collected a used straw, and from the third, a discarded toothbrush. Donald and Kenneth were not a match. Jerry, on the other hand, was an exact match. Matt tracked down Jerry to his business, an hour away in Manchester. He picked a very special day to interview him, December 19, 2018, exactly 39 years since Michelle's murder. Positioned across from him, Matt had a camera hidden in his coffee mug, hoping to capture a confession. Matt knew in his gut that he was looking at Michelle's killer. Matt asked him for a DNA sample, and Jerry agreed. Then Matt held no punches. He told Jerry that they already had his DNA, and that it matched the DNA at the crime scene, and asked him, how did it get there? Jerry didn't have an answer. Then Matt asked him, what happened that night? Jerry said he didn't know. When he was asked, did you murder someone that night? Jerry didn't say no. He didn't say yes. Instead, he answered, test the DNA. 64-year-old Jerry was arrested and charged with first-degree murder. 
He pled not guilty and claimed he did not murder Michelle. Four decades later, he went on trial for her murder. Several of Michelle's friends testified, including her ex-boyfriends Andy and Mike. The prosecution presented the evidence, their only evidence, the DNA. There was a one in 100 billion chance the DNA belonged to someone other than Jerry. There were only 8 billion people in the entire world. That made it improbable it could be anyone else. An inmate who befriended Jerry in jail testified that Jerry told him no matter what happened, he'd won because he'd had all these years with his family. Jerry's family, particularly his children, didn't believe their father could be a murderer. Jerry's lawyer tried to explain his DNA on the car's gear shift by saying Jerry worked at a Buick dealership and perhaps Michelle's car had been at the dealership. In Matt's interview with CBC News, he sarcastically asked, Did the dress go to the dealership too? After two weeks of testimony, the jury needed only three hours to reach a verdict. Guilty of first-degree murder. The courtroom fell silent. Jerry was sentenced to life in prison with no parole. Five years after Michelle's murder, her mother told the Cedar Rapids Gazette that when she saw her daughter's body at the hospital, she expected to see a look of torture on her face. But instead, she saw a peaceful look and said, that makes me think she must be in a very nice place. Thanks for listening to Murder in 20 with less talk and more true crime. We're taking a short break for the holidays and we'll be back January 11, 2023 with another year of interesting and captivating true crime podcasts. Next week, we're featuring a recap of one of Murder in 20's most intriguing episodes. Be sure to tune in next Wednesday for the episode of Johnny Jackson. Byron felt Johnny took something that was his, a part of him, that he'd stolen something precious that couldn't be returned. And he vowed he would get it back by taking something equally precious of Johnny's, his life. We'd like to acknowledge Purple Planet for use of their music, sound effects from Fasting Studios, and Quick Sounds and our many editorial sources who were listed on our website. If you're dying to hear more, past episodes of Murder in 20 are available for free at murderin20.com and on all major podcast platforms. Be sure to like, share, and follow us to learn about upcoming episodes every Wednesday. And feel free to leave a five-star review on any one of them, or all of them. We're not shy. Stay safe. Sleep with the lights on, and don't play with strangers.